This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Linode, high-performance cloud hosting for everyone. Visit linode.com slash macvoices and take $20 off your first server package. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, I have the privilege and the pleasure today of doing two things I always enjoy. I get to welcome a first-time guest to Mac Voices, and even better, I get to welcome a first-time Take Control author to Mac Voices. I'd like you to meet Robin Wiseman. She is the author of Take Control of Your Browser. Robin, welcome. It's great to have you. I'm thrilled to be here. I've watched your podcast so many times, and now I'm actually on it, and I did never, I never expected that to happen in my well, lifetime. So here I am. Yes. Well, thank you, first of all, for watching. And it's it's a pleasure to have you. Um, Joe Kissel has told me quite a bit about you. But before we dig into the book, I'd like for you to tell the audience about yourself, where where you come from, what your background is, and how you ended up writing Take Control of Your Browser. Let's see. I am from Los Angeles, which if you read the book, you'll see a lot of references to Los Angeles in it. I'm a native, a second generation native. My mother was born here. I actually have no technical background whatsoever as far as formal training. I came from an aggressively liberal arts family to the point that my one mathematically inclined cousin went to MIT and studied English. So that was kind of the world I came from. Um, so about 20 years ago, I went to film school. And after I graduated, wasn't quite sure what I was doing. And I certainly didn't want to be a wait. No, I mean, no offense to anybody who, because it's a hard job. I didn't want to wait tables. I didn't want to be a legal assistant for the rest of my life. So I kind of fell into tech writing, started writing um, Mac reviews for Mac Attic Magazine, um, started writing for a bunch of business websites, um, and just kept doing it and kind of, I guess, enjoyed it. I guess my inner geek. Um, just really like doing it, I guess. So um, after writing for various publications for probably, let's say, 10, 12 years, I thought, I mean, to be perfectly blunt, I'm not making any money doing this. So maybe I should go into marketing writing. And so I started working with small enterprise tech firms and found myself um, going towards cybersecurity so I spent about a year and a half at this um, media company called ISMG. Then I worked for a bunch of other um, tech, mostly um, cybersecurity companies. And for the last year, I've been with Venify, which is a Salt Lake City-based company that specializes in machine identity protection, which is basically, not to give you the spiel for the company, but it's basically anything that has, to, has a certificate or a key the job of my company is to protect those keys and certificates in the sense of like that they're like usernames and passwords, but for machines. So when they connect, they connect safely. And actually the book talks a bit about that in the security section as Joe actually does not take control of your online privacy. So it's actually, um, it's been a great experience and I feel like there's something else I should be saying, but that isn't me in a nutshell. No, that's that that's great. I mean, that says a lot about about your tech credibility, if 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 there is such a thing, you know, and and why you were qualified to write uh, take control of your browser. Yeah, and just I think part of the reason why the um, topic appealed to me so much is is I remember right when I was like in film school, and the first time I got off AOL onto a real browser, you know, Netscape Navigator, whatever the first version was. And I was like, you can do all these things. You can shop. I mean, the first thing, of course, was probably shopping. And I thought, wow, Tower Records is going to be gone in 12 years for however long. And it is. So, I mean, I knew that there was a revolution coming. But, you know, in the 1990s, you couldn't really quite figure out what that was going to be. Um, and now, 20 years later, we have a much better idea of what that is. Yes. I think some of us understood understood that a little better as it as it developed and others just didn't and and i'm i can't claim that i was one that had the complete vision i mean it was connecting people it was giving access to information which always was the thing for me but it's gone so much beyond that that in areas you just never thought 
oh my God, you're not kidding. I mean, I, I wish I had hindsight for some of the things I've done on the internet in retrospect. So, <laughs> Don't we all? Don't we all? I know, really. It's like I'm using DuckDuckGo in this hopes that somehow I'm going to keep my information private when I know that it's everywhere because of my <laughs> years of stupidity. So, anyway. <laughs> Well, let's start with with one basic thing. I want to make sure that this audience understands. Obviously, there's going to be a, a significant um, Apple and Macintosh component to this book. Is is this a book also for Windows and those who primarily use iOS? It's okay. Let's be frank. I am a Mac user. Take Control historically has been more geared toward Mac users, and I admit. I probably in the next version hope to do a better job with Windows. And we can talk a little bit more later why I actually have legitimate reasons why I didn't address certain issues. But it's mostly for um, Mac OS and Windows 10 users to work with their browsers. I do have a chapter on working with your mobile browser, but just because I guess with when you look at smartphones, you've got a combination of apps mobile browsers, apps that are like mobile browsers and wrappers and so forth. And I didn't think that that was a big pain point. Joe and I agreed. And so when you get on your computer, sometimes the only thing you fire up is your browser. I mean, I don't. But I mean, in a lot of cases, that's all people use. If you're using Chrome OS, you're basically using a browser for your operating system. You're doing all your stuff on a browser, whether that's, um, you know, writing, or editing a photograph or, you know, having a meeting, let's say on Zoom, for example, this is all done via web browser. And I mean, I think that that's part of the reason why, um, for example, we were talking before the show about Max and how you brought Max to your company and how my company lets us use Max. I think a lot of that has to do with the ability to use a cross platform browser that can handle pretty much anything that you throw at it. So. Okay. That's, well, that's good. Just so we can kind of lay some groundwork with that. Um, so the next thing I want to want to ask you is, so browsers are, some people are, are just like religious fanatics about their browsers. I mean, you know, they are you're wedded to one and it's absolutely the best. I mean, it's, it's almost like, you know, a lot of us are about, about our Macs, right? About, about Apple in general, and there are other people who just say a browser is a browser. You know, I type in a URL and I go there, and it's not a real big deal as to which browser I happen to be using. And so I, I'm not quite sure which is the right approach to that. I mean, do you have strong feelings about one browser over another, or are there specific things in certain browsers that really appeal to you, or you think? are objectively better performers? I don't think I'm a browser fanatic by any means. However, I do mostly use Safari. Um, to my mind, it feels quicker to me than any of the other browsers. And I actually like the fact that there's less craft than let's say um, Chrome or Firefox. And Chrome and Firefox, I kind of label them the big three in my book because they're the three browsers I focus on. Um, they're all good browsers. It's just, I think, a personal preference. And having said that, I use different browsers for different reasons. I mean, I'll admit, most of the stuff I do in Safari, but for Chrome, when I was a freelancer, a lot of the web apps I used had Chrome extensions where they didn't have Safari extensions. Also, it's getting better, but there are still a lot of sites, like let's say your health insurance portal, or your 401k, where for some reason they're still in 2006 with these weird pop-ups and whatnot, and the Safari can't handle it, you know? So Chrome is the place I usually go to handle that. Has that answered? I mean, that's, that's I, I feel like I'm, there's like another point that I'm forgetting, but. Um, well, no, I, I mean, I, I think what you're talking about, that, that's kind of where I was going with it, that, you know, are there reasons really to to use, let's say, multiple browsers or in certain situations use one browser versus another? And the pop-ups, I didn't think about that, honestly, but that, that's a real good point that, you know, 
Safari doesn't always handle some of those, and Chrome is much, much more adept at dealing with some of that stuff. And of course, Chrome also can still, as far as I know, still open the dreaded flash sites if there are any still out there. Oh God, ouch. <laughs> My eyes hurt when you said that. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Well, what's funny is, is that, I, you know, if there was a period of time where I did use Chrome a lot, more than Safari. I mean, it was my primary browser. And actually, one of the reasons I stopped, we talked about this briefly, is because of autoplay. Safari has had autoplay stopper, like, you know, the ability to stop autoplay as has Fire, uh, no, no, Firefox only got it this year. I'm sorry. Let me backtrack. But Safari's had it for a long time. But Chrome still does not, and certainly didn't when I had my experience. Um, should I, is it all right if I bring it up again? Oh, sure. Okay. Sure. The reason I stopped using Chrome is because I was freelancing for a company, and um, there was a product manager who just, he, he thought he was very intelligent, for a lack of a better way to put it. And he was droning on and really wanted to know what the score of the Dodger Giants game was. So I kind of surreptitiously, because you know, you're just on, I think it was like go to meeting. I was I just figured I'll check really quickly. And suddenly a beer ad started blaring, you know, because autoplay went off and I wasn't expecting it. And in my I was fumbling basically to um to mute my computer. And in the muting, you know, it just it became a mess. Suffice to say I lost the job <laughs> because of it. I probably would have lost it anyway, because um, he was a very unpleasant person. It was just not a good match. Anyway, but, you know, even though in some sense browsers are a lot alike, oh my God, they're very different too. I feel like I just said something that was just completely as trite as possible. But in other words, um, there's a reason why we have preferences for certain browsers, I think. But um, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a safari like nut or anything like that. So right, well, I, and and I think you know everybody's sort of a product of their experiences. Just just like that one, you know, it, it, there's not a right answer to so many of these things. Even though we think that Apple and Macintosh and iOS are the answer to most things, um, there are still sometimes it's just not the right answer, and you know you, you have to figure out what the right answer is for you. But when you okay, so how so how did you approach take control of your browser? What I mean, what are your objectives here? Um, what specific things do you want us to be taking away from this book or learning to do with our browsers that maybe we weren't up to this point? I think I wanted to um, codify some of the things that I've randomly figured out over the years that helped me browse more effectively. And a lot of times that was just by trial and error. Like, you know, just one day I just, who knows why I happened to um, command T, for example, and suddenly I had a new tab open or, you know, just right clicking. And I mean, all that stuff kind of comes up and you talk to friends and they give you advice. And then I just thought, well, wouldn't it be nice if some of those things were just in a book? Because weirdly, there's, there really isn't any book about this. I think the closest was like a podcast that I heard two or three years ago. And so um, when Joe and I talked about it, we just figured there's got to, I mean, there's a, there's a value in, in this type of book where you literally look up and see how you can be safe on a browser, how you can use tabs to the greatest effect, how you can avoid doing what I call extremely ineffective searching where you go to, let's say, the Google homepage and you type in something and then you, you click on that and then you click on something else, but there are much faster ways of doing things. Um, and I feel like the, the audience of take control are always looking for that. Is always looking for that. And uh, I just thought that it would be a useful book to have. Having said that, it also made me realize as I was approaching it, that, I didn't know as much about browsers as I thought. In other words, every time I had to do show anything like how to use a tab, how to stop autoplay, I'm obviously obsessed with those two things, but um, I realized that every time I went into, let's say, you know, I knew how to do it in Safari, let's say, but then I had to go into Firefox and Firefox did it differently. And in the case of autoplay, Chrome still doesn't have a way of, 
of handling autoplay except for doing some strange um, pseudo coding that I explained in the book and I couldn't tell you about short of reading it again. I mean, it was like a one-time thing. So I just figured it, I figured it would be useful. And I wanted, and it just sounded like a, something that I would be interested in doing, which I was. Well, you make a really excellent point that there, there are very few manuals for browsers out there. I mean, sure, if you want to read release notes, um, but who, who, frankly, who reads release notes? Um, and with, with the exception, I can, I can specifically remember some Apple presentations about we're bringing these new features to Firefox. Interestingly, one of the ones I absolutely specifically remember was a round of applause for you know, the, the autoplay and being able to mute that automatically. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, we all, we all pick up a new browser and say, oh, okay, I know exactly what to do. I'll type in www.mikevoices.com and you know, I'm, I'm up and running. And you miss all those little features and all those little niceties that can make things so much more effective and so much more useful. Exactly. Because I, I, I'm, sitting, I'm sitting here thinking about tabs. I'm thinking about the different, some of the different ways to manage bookmarks or display bookmarks. Um, I know people that don't use bookmarks at all, and it makes me a little crazy because that, that they're typing in their five or ten favorite websites all the time instead of just saving it somewhere and being able to click on it. Yeah, I actually talk about bookmarks in the book because I think that there tends to be just like there are extremes as far as what browser you like, I'll only use Chrome, I'll only use Safari. There are people, okay, I am generalizing, I don't think really the world is like this, but you know, to, let's just for simplicity's sake, it seems like there are people who bookmark pretty much everything, which is, I have to admit, is what I did when the feature first came out. Um, and then there are other people who are like, well, what's the point of bookmarks? I can always search for whatever I want. You know, and so when I'm in the book itself, and again, this is a reason to have this book. Um, first of all, let's face it. Did you really think about bookmarks too much before you, I mean, I'm just saying, I don't know if I thought about them too much, but what I realized is that I tended to bookmark everything and then I couldn't find anything. And then other people would say they never bookmark anything, but they have problems finding things as well. And so I think that they're, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book is just the ability to use everything, I guess, in moderation. I think ultimately that's what the book is about, is that something like bookmarks, they're very useful, but within reason. And it's much easier to go to a bookmark than to try to research for some, when I re-search for something over and over again. Well, I agree. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. And I think that people need to be shown some of those things. I know I've showed a couple people some, just a few little tricks that I, I used. If somebody, I, I read them somewhere and took that and leveraged it for the way I use a browser and the way I surf. And sometimes just the way you use a browser for business or for whatever your, your endeavors are. And they, they're, they're always shocked. It's like, well, I didn't know you could do that. I didn't know that it would do that or I had that option or it's it's buried in a menu somewhere and I didn't realize that's what that meant or that's what it did. I mean, it's it's not Photoshop by any means, but at the same right. time, most people I don't think really take the time to explore what's in a lot of those menus and realize how how powerful it can be and what a difference it can make. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's true. I mean, taking bookmarks, for example, you don't have, for example, if you have them on your favorites bar, you don't have to have what the um, title is of the web page, which is usually something like, so, you know, several words long, you can shorten it. And one of the nice things about doing that is that, like, let's say I use LI for LinkedIn, for example. If I type in LI in my address bar, LinkedIn shows up automatically. So it's not only that I've got it there conveniently located, but that it's like one less thing for me to do, for example. Yeah. So, 
Yeah. And one of my favorites that I use probably every day is to create a folder for that bookmark bar. And then you can pull down and, and open any one uh, website in the list, or you can go to the bottom and say open all, and they all open up in different tabs. And th- I mean, that, that just saves me, you know, that many clicks that much time. And it's something that especially in publishing Mac voices, I mean, I have a tab, excuse me, a folder specifically for that so that everywhere I need to post a notice or an update or whatever, just one command and it's all, they're all open, ready for me to work. Yeah, that's great. I actually, I need to add that to the next version of the book because I haven't used that in a while. I guess I've been using um, pin tabs for what I've, for what my work purposes are. Um, I, well, see, that's it. We all use these things so much differently and we can learn from each other. Right, exactly. And what I'm kind of hoping is that as the book has been out for a while, that people will, you know, contact us and say, hey, you didn't talk about this, but what about that? You know, just various things, just like um, your comment about the um, open all in tabs. I mean, it's something I used to use, but I had completely forgotten about, and it didn't make the book. And I know that, um, and one of the things I like about Take Control Books in general is there's always new iterations, you know, that we can add really easily. Um, And I think that that makes it almost a living document of of sorts. Um, So folks, if you have favorites, uh, uh, browser tips, send them to Robin now to make the next version of the book. Yeah, exactly. Especially if you're a Windows user, because um, I admit, I, I feel like Windows users got shortchanged. But having said that, may I describe why that is sort of the case? Please do. We talked just a little bit pre-show, and I'd love to have you tell tell us part of that story. All right. Um, well, originally, there was going to be the big four browsers. Um, Right now, there are the big three browsers, which are Safari, because we're Mac users, um, Chrome, and Firefox. But they were going to, I was going to include Edge, because my assumption was that Edge was like the Windows version of Safari, that the majority of Windows people used it, maybe it was faster than Chrome or Firefox, didn't have as much um, additional features, but maybe not as much craft. And then I did... I looked at some statistics that showed that even though there are more edge users than Safari users, just by virtue of the fact that there are way more Windows computers in the world than um, Mac computers, weirdly in North America, a higher percentage of people use Internet Explorer than Edge, which I don't really understand. That literally means that, that like, so many of these users literally downloaded an app that I don't think has been updated in how long, like six years, eight years. It's ugly. It's not safe. Um, It's kind of frightening. And so between that, didn't the fact that it just wasn't being used by as many Windows users as I had thought, And combine that with the fact that um, Microsoft is actually planning to do a new version of Microsoft Edge using the Chromium engine, which is what is used for Chrome, Opera, Vivaldi, and like a trillion other browsers for that matter, that it seemed like it didn't make sense for me to recommend that Windows users, I mean, they can use Edge, but I, I felt like at this point, maybe it'd be safer just to stick with Chrome or Firefox at this point in time. So, This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Linode, your solution when you need a virtual server in the cloud. Need a virtual cloud server like now? Linode has you covered. You can deploy a new server customized to your purposes with the features you want in seconds. Time is money, and if you have that immediate need, Linode is there. And even if you don't need your new server that quickly, Linode is there. And these aren't just any servers. These are SSD-based, 40 gigabit, high-performance processor-powered servers that are suitable for web hosting, distributed applications, hosted servers, and more. Pick from a simple $5 per month Nanodes plan, or ramp the whole way up to a high-powered dedicated CPU. 
When you need to upgrade, as your requirements demand, that upgrade is just a click away. To make some deployments even easier, there's a host of one-click installs, with everything from Minecraft to WordPress. Need to locate your server in a particular location for either performance or legal reasons? No problem. Linode has data centers all over the world, including their newest in Canada and one coming soon in Mumbai. Perhaps most important, though, is their pricing. No surprises, no hidden costs. You pay for what you need, and you pay for what you use on an hourly basis. No hidden data transfer fees like some of the larger cloud services. It's your data. Why would you expect to pay to access it? With Linode, you don't. These are just a few of the features that Linode brings to the table. I want you to visit linode.com slash macvoices right now and see what all the fuss is about and take $20 off your first server package. Again, linode.com slash macvoices takes $20 off your first server package. You've been thinking about that virtual server all your own for a long time. Make it happen today with Linode. Thanks to Linode for their support of Mac Voices. And at some point, and that's one of the one of the hallmarks of Take Control books, they don't try to answer every single question or address every single possibility. They they focus on the important things and the and the things that the majority of users are interested in or need to know. And so, you know, I, I don't think that that omission is. I mean, sorry, Windows users, but you know, I, that's that's the simple fact. Those are the simple facts. Yeah. Exactly. Robin, we would be remiss if we didn't just touch on the issue of security. Uh, is that something that you address in the book uh, for one or more of the browsers? Yeah, I address security um, in two sections, both in the safeguard your browsing section and then also in part of the extensions section. Um, yes, yeah, security is a huge problem to say the least. And Oddly, I, I had problems writing this because I'm so inundated with security messaging from my company that it's almost like I, I needed Joe's help to sort of bring it in a little bit more um, for take control users. But um, there are just a lot of things you can do to, to make your browser safe. I mean, something as simple as if you're a Safari user, do you know that, that um, in the preferences, the general preferences where it says open safe files after um, downloading. Do you know that section? Mm -hmm. It's checked by default, which is the stupidest thing in the world because literally Apple's not going to know or whoever is, you know, the developers of Mac OS aren't going to know every permutation or every development of something that comes across as a safe file, but it is in fact malware. So you've got things like that that can be easily fixed and things that, you know, maybe can't be easily as fixed, but that you can at least do to make your um, browsing situation safer and avoid a lot of grief, like, I don't know, identity theft, um, you know, tons of web pages. I guess it doesn't really happen anymore. I guess the big one is really identity theft more than anything else. Um, but, you know, in saying all this, I've, I mean, I talk about cross-site scripting and not using third-party cookies. And I beat people on the head about using a password manager. Um, not surprisingly, like most Mac or take control users, I use 1Password. Um, and that's my reference point. But certainly LastPass is a good option. And Dashlane... I'm not sure about the free option because you only are allowed like 50 passwords, but I'm, I've heard good things about that in general as well. But I think my biggest security takeaway or, or the takeaway I want people to have more than anything is just stepping back. In other words, I, you know, I've been in cybersecurity now for at least six years and I know about phishing. I know about the various things as a human that I can do to make myself unsafe or make my company unsafe or, you know, my network unsafe or what have you. But if I'm half asleep and I get an email that says, you know, like iTunes discount card, you know, iTunes cards, 30% off, I'll click on it because I'm not thinking, you know, it's just a reactive thing. I want the cheaper um, 
gift card. And then I realized what I've done and I've got to go back and change passwords. And, you know, I mean, it's pretty minor in the scheme of things, but still I'm saying that here I am someone who actually is in the field and doing stupid things like that. Um, so my recommendation pretty much to anybody is if something seems off, take a step back, don't react. Instead, you know, res respond instead. In other words, the web isn't going anywhere. In fact, we kind of wish the web would go somewhere as far as like the stuff that we've put on it over the years. But most of the stuff will be there 10 or 15 minutes later or a day later if you're just not sure about it. And so it, that's my biggest tip to anybody is just to not react quickly to anything. Just to, you know, if something doesn't seem 100% right, you can step back. And that's, I mean, in fact, I, I, my, I do this with my mother, for example, where she gets, she gets something weird on, you know, an email or something on the web asking for something that doesn't make sense. And she calls me to make sure that, um, that this is safe or not safe. And I usually tell her, no, it's not safe, you know, great work. And um, it's, I think that that's a pretty simple way to make yourself a lot safer putting aside all the things you can do and it's too i mean it's too bad we've gotten to that point because a reasonable percentage of the time probably those links are safe the trouble is that the one that isn't is going to get you in so much trouble or potentially get you in so much trouble or cause so much trouble maybe is a better way to say it that it's just it's just not worth it i mean i I'm I'm absolutely militant. I will not click on the statements from my my credit cards or my bank when they send it. Oh, your, your new statement is available. Click here. Okay, I'm going to go to the trouble of going to my browser instead of my email client, and I probably have a bookmark set up, or I just you know will type it in, go log in, and get the statement that way. It's not as convenient. But we are talking about my financial information here. So that's one thing I definitely don't want to endanger. And it's, it's, it's just a darn shame that it's happened this way, but it has. And so I think your advice is, is very, very well, well founded. Yeah. And also, I mean, now it, it, when you think about phishing sites, let's say even like not even 10 years ago, usually you could tell pretty easily if the site was a phishing site, like there was something funky about like the way PayPal looked like maybe there was something wrong with the logo today. You literally can go on. I think at one point is there like an early 2017, you could have found 14,000 PayPal lookalike sites and they would have looked exactly like PayPal. There's no way you would have known short of, you know, really studying the URL, which, you know, let's face it, most people don't do at all, and who can blame them. Um, and you're, you're risking the possibility of putting your information into the bad guy's hands. So you really have to be more vigilant um, to handle it, and you do have to have the tools in place, you know, whether it's um, your settings, whether it's something like a dedicated password manager, like one password, um, you just need to, it's, it's, I guess, prophylactic in, in nature. It's much better to do that than be reactive and have to scramble. And I mean, one of my biggest fears is identity theft. And so I just, anything I can do to avoid that, I will do, which I guess is not unique, but. Well, and, and the, the amount of time it takes to recover from any kind of hack, whether it's a mistake you made or a mistake somebody else made or, you know, whatever. I mean, it just, it, the amount of time it sucks up trying to, to fix it. And, and, it's, and if, it, it, if it affects your life in a negative way other than just taking time, that's even worse. So anything we can do from in our browsers or anywhere else, and, and email and browsers are obviously the probably the two biggest places that you, you have these exposures because you, you're getting things from so many different places into your email and you're trying to visit so many different places in your browser. Right, exactly. Um, and, oh, I was just going to make one more point about um, security, if you didn't mind. Um, no, please. Um, just 
one of the other reasons I just wanted to point out to use a password manager like 1Password, I mean, I realize this is not the main topic of this conversation, is that now um, bad guys are so sophisticated that let's say you have something like Amazon.com. Well, they will take, let's say, in a phishing site, they will take an, a Cyrillic A and stick it in there. And to the naked eye, you literally can't tell whether it's a Roman letter A or Cyrillic A, but it'll take you to a different place. And something like 1Password, if you try to log in with your credentials, um, I'm sorry, that was enterprise speak, with your username and password, um, it won't let you log in. And that's because it's not actually amazon.com. So it's another reason that it's a fairly easy way to safeguard yourself um, without much grief on your part. And it'll certainly save you a lot of grief in the long run. And I know that there are people that, and, and Apple does, Apple does a decent job with um, with some of its utilities and keychain and all. But I think there's a lot of value to something like 1Password. Well, since we both use it, I'm happy to recommend it. That the this is what these people do. That's all they do is a password manager. And so they stay abreast of all the latest hacks, all the latest techniques used by the bad guys and try to give us options for those things. And so I, I just, I don't think it's realistic to say, well, this should be handled by the browser because there's so many other things that we want the browsers to do. And we want uh, Apple for Safari and Google for Chrome um, and the Firefox people for Firefox to, to, to keep advancing those browsers. And not that security shouldn't be part of that, but it's just such a specialized area and it's such an important area that I'd, it's, it's like picking a surgeon. You know, I, if, if I have to have surgery, I want someone that has done just that kind of surgery and has done a lot of them so that they're likely to be successful with me. Right, exactly. You're not so. going to pick a general practitioner just because he's he or she is a doctor. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Robin, I did want to. Uh, we're we're coming to the end here, time wise. But there's so many, so many, so many things I want to ask you about. But I do want to ask you about um, add-ons and extensions. And I, at the moment, I'm forgetting which what they're called for each for each browser. Um, Let me, I, know, I, can, I can educate you on that because oh, if please. I couldn't, it would be very embarrassing. Um, both Safari and Chrome use the term extension. Firefox, which I think is the originator of the concept of extensions says add-ons. But I think you honestly you could say extensions for any of the, of the three. Um, okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, no, no, I, how do you feel about those? I mean, do you feel that, I mean, obviously they done right, they can add a lot of functionality, but do they introduce a security and do they introduce performance degradation if you stack a bunch of them in to, to any of the browsers? Oh, for sure. Um, I think security kind of goes without saying just because uh, in a lot of cases um, extensions have access to your information. And there's been a lot of cases where either someone got into either they, um, the Chrome web store had a malicious extension on their site or someone messed with a legitimate extension and they've been able to um, scrape data, you know, personal data from, you know, from just from your browsing experience. Uh, and in fact, Apple right now is going through a transition where they're going from traditional extensions to extension apps. I'm not sure, are you familiar with that? That like, in other words, you can go to the Safari gallery, like we've always been able to do since that's been available, but, um, they're increasingly um, deprecating those in favor of these apps that are literally separate apps, you know, with an app suff suffix and that work on Safari, but they don't have access to your information in the way a traditional extension will. Um, having said that, I mean, Safari, if you want extensions, Safari is probably not the place to go. You can get basic ones, let's say like Pocket, 1Password, 
mean, those are the two, <laughs> honey. Um, there's a few, but you're not going to get the extensibility that you're going to get on Firefox and certainly not what you can get on Chrome. And it, extensions can be awesome. I mean, there are a lot of, you know, one of the things about using Safari that's a trade-off is that there are certain extensions on Chrome that I really wish Safari had that just make my life a lot easier. An example that I talk about in the book um, is this one called OneTab. Are you familiar with OneTab? No, I'm not. OneTab is basically, you know, one of the big problems is, is uh, you know, with any browser, but Chrome is notorious for this, is that you have too many tabs open and short of having like an iMac Pro or the latest Alienware computer, which, you know, it's not like I wouldn't love one, but let's face it, you know, we all have budgets and that's just not um, in the cards for most of us. Um, it really slows down your browsing. And so what one tab does is you click on it and it literally turns all your tabs into a list that you can alter in however you want. You can either just have them there until you want to click on them and then they disappear. You can lock them into groups. You can name them. So for example, let's say I'm working on a project for my company or let's say I was, when I was freelancing, I can have, let's say, a whole series of um, URLs for let's say PK. I should probably talk about something more not so security related, but um, let's say I'm trying to, I'm um, redecorating my house and there are all these articles that I want to look at, but I just can't look at right now. And I don't want to keep a million tabs open. One, one tab will literally make a list for you. It's in literally one window. It takes away about, it gives you back about 95% of your RAM to use on other things until you're ready to, let's say, you know, look at how you're going to redecorate your home. So, I mean, those are some huge advantages there. Um, there are other extensions that unfortunately for the most part Safari doesn't have that make, you know, certain web apps work better. You know, an example would be, let's say Trello, um, which is task management where you can more easily input things where you can, I don't know if, I mean, I don't know how much the read or your viewers know about Trello, but it tends to scroll horizontally endlessly. And there's an extension in the name of, I'm totally blanking on, I'm sorry, um, where it allows you to um, have it set up however you want because no one wants to, to go horizontally. I mean, we're just not made to do that. We're made to go up and down. So um, there's just a lot of advantages there. Now you also asked me about, you know, slowing down performance. Yeah, the more extensions you have, you have to think of them like multiple apps, whether they're traditional apps, the way Apple, in the direction that Apple's going in, or if just traditional extensions. They're always gonna take away from your, um, you know, your RAM. Um, and your ability, your memory, and your ability to um, use your browser, let alone use whatever other app you're using in a given day. So, you know, I have a few recommendations in the book, which is, you know, only use the the extensions that you truly are going to use. There's no reason to have, let's say, you know, 50 extensions because they all seem cool on your browser. Because if you're not using them, they're not benefiting you. Um, in addition to that, I think it's important that you, well, first of all, I think it's important that you always get them from reputable sources, which in this case would be for the big three browsers. You know, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on what Firefox this is called, but they, you know, they have basically a web store, the Chrome web store, and then for Apple, either the app store for the newer ones, or to some degree, you can still go to Safari Gallery. You don't want to get them off someone's, um, even the developer's website, I would be reluctant to do. And you certainly just don't want to pick them up anywhere, like from like a software download site, because there's a good chance that they will be, there will be malware in them, whether it was purposeful or not. Um, the other thing I would recommend is that you periodically, just like you do with bookmarks or anything else, you check um, 
your extensions every so often. You know, you maybe you make a note every six months to look at your extensions and see have they been updated recently. Is there a better alternative? Because you really want an extension to be an active development. You don't want to, I mean, maybe this extension worked great in 2016, but if it literally hasn't been updated since 2016, um, you know, there have been a lot of iterations of let's say Chrome since then. So you just want to make sure, I mean, this is another aspect of um, safety as well as performance that I think is important for people to know about. I'm sorry we kind of got too focused on the safety and security thing, but I, I think it's such an important, first of all, it's an important topic, and I think it's one that's foremost in everyone's mind right now. And it seems like every single day we, you know, you turn on the morning news or pick up the morning paper or whatever you do to get your information, and there's another hack, whether it's whether it's something that Facebook did or whether it's something that a company did or whether it's something that the bad guys actively did. Right. And so we're we're all so aware of some of this stuff. And your web browser is one of the big issues that needs to be addressed. But hopefully hopefully folks will look at this and they'll take some of our earlier discussions about being efficient with your browser and, you know, be intrigued enough to check the book out because in, in looking over it, I mean there's so many great things here and like I said, we could we could go on for an hour with this. Right. Um but, you know, so maybe we'll have to come back and revisit it, uh, some of the other topics at another time. But I want to make sure folks know that it is Take Control of Your Browser uh, at TakeControlBooks.com. Um, Robin, how much is it? Do you recall? Um, the list price is fourteen ninety nine. Okay, so cheap information, cheap, cheap at any price just because of the information here. And I guarantee you that you will find some things in here that – will make your browsing better. Hopefully we'll enlighten you a little bit on some of the safety and security issues that Robin mentioned here. And just in general, get you to use your browser a little more, a little better and a little more efficiently. Yeah, because I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go, please. I was just going to say, because it's strange that browsers in one sense are like the easiest things in the world to use, but it's like anything where something's very easy and then there's sort of a level where you kind of get stuck and then there's ways, there are ways to use it that make it even easier, I guess. And that was the goal of this book. Yeah. Well, judging by what I've seen, I don't think there's any question that you achieved that. Um, but, and, and the interesting thing is just in the, our conversation here, we came up with at least one or two additional ideas. So folks, again, contact Robin if you have your own ideas, because um, I, I know she'd love to hear them. I'd love to hear them too. Yeah, for sure. Robin, where can folks find you other than, of course, as the author of this book? Um, are you on social media or do you have a preferred uh, place or way that folks can contact you? Um, I actually am not on Facebook because of the stuff that we just talked about. Um, they can reach me on Twitter at Robin Weissman, just one word. Um, I'm in the midst of have multiple websites and so I'm reluctant to give them out. One is robinweissman.com and it's completely out of date. And then um, my company before I joined my current company was writetechcontent.com. The easiest way to reach me, however, is just to write me at um, robin, R-O-B-Y-N, at robinweissman.com, which is R-O-B-Y-N, W-E-I-S-M-A-N.com. Great. Or via Twitter is fine. Uh, yeah. However you do it, folks, get in touch with Robin and, and share your tips or ask questions um, because who knows, those questions might lead to something else in the next iteration of the book. For sure. I'd appreciate it. Robin, we, we, we have to do this again. It's it's a pleasure to meet you, and, and I really appreciate you taking the time here. And if you're willing, we will definitely have you back on Mac Voices. I would love that. This has been uh, fun for me, too. Count on it. Count on it. Okay, great. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. Again, this is Mac Voices. Uh, go go check this out. I guarantee you it's one of those books that you're going to say, yeah, I knew that. Yeah, I knew that. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Wow, I can really use that you will not be disappointed. Until the next time, and as always, thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for show notes and to connect with Chuck on social media. 
get involved in our Facebook group or like our Facebook page, and get more out of your Apple tech with Mac Voices Magazine, free on Flipboard and on the web. And if you find value in it all, consider supporting us through either our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash macvoices, or by making a one-time donation via the PayPal link on our front page and in the show notes of each episode. You will join these fine people who help bring you Mac Voices. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.